We'll continue with lessons from Luke. Part two. Uh, this is uh, Luke chapter six. Yeah. Now it came to pass, uh, verse one, on the second Sabbath of the first rank, that's the first season of the holy days, that would be the last day of unleavened bread, pretty much, that he was walking through the grain fields and his disciples were plucking the ears and were eating after rubbing them in their hands. Some of the Pharisees said to them, why are you doing that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbaths? Well, what were they doing that was so wrong in the Pharisees' eyes? What were they doing that was so wrong? They were harvesting. Harvesting and winnowing. <laughs> and preparing if, if, uh, and I everything else. I believe that they kind of knew that's not what they were doing, but they were just trying to raise a, an issue. Yeah. But in their, in their minds, uh, uh, nobody should be doing that. Nobody should be doing that. Was it, was it legal for them to be in, in someone's field and plucking and e eating? It was. They just couldn't harvest for real, you know, and, and gather for you know plenty and, and using uh, tools to, you know. But you could go into someone's field and if you're hungry and grab an ear of corn or something like that. There was nothing really wrong in the law for what they were doing. Uh, be kind of like, well, what if you had a vegetable garden in your own yard? And on Sabbath day, you were going to make supper. Go out into your vegetable garden and get some vegetables for supper. Isn't that the same thing? Isn't that the same thing? Yes. So what really were they doing that was wrong? Nothing, really. Makes you wonder just how strict they made the Sabbath day, how harsh they made the Sabbath day. That any little thing that could be construed as work was frowned upon and condemned. And we can just get snippets of it from, from reading the Gospels of what it was like. So the Sabbath day really was a yoke of hardship and bondage for these people. And in verse 3, Jesus gives them sort of an answer. He said, Have you not read even this, that which David did when he himself hungered, and those who were with him, how he went into the house of God and took the loaves of showbread, and he ate of them, and also gave some to those with him, which is not lawful to eat, except for the priests only? It's true. There were showbread representing each of the 12 tribes, each Sabbath, and it was only for the, for the priests to eat. It was not lawful for anyone other than the priests to eat that. But David was fleeing Saul at the time, wasn't he? And he and those who were with him were very hungry. And they needed something to eat. And the priests even said, well, this is, all we have is the showbread. This, that's all we have. But did the priest deny the king from eating that showbread? No. No. They, they, they didn't. Now, a greater than David, the king of Israel, was here before the Pharisees. David wasn't condemned for doing that. I mean, there was a cost associated with that, which is irrelevant to this particular um, study. But he wasn't condemned under the law for, for that. And a greater than David is here in front of these disciples. 
And you look in verse 5, he said to them, The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. What does that mean to you when Jesus says, The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath? What do you suppose that means? <clears throat> God placed all things under his feet, under him. He did indeed. And that would include the Sabbath. Including the Sabbath. <clears throat> and why would even the Sabbath be under him? It's interesting, isn't it? Uh, when Jesus declared, and what would the Pharisees have taken from that statement? The Son of Man is Lord. When you're a lord of something, is there anybody above you other than God? If you're a king, is there anybody above you other than God? No. So a king can do what he wants, couldn't he? It's his kingdom. When Jesus declared that he was lord of the Sabbath day, the, uh, the Pharisees who heard this would have recognized that, that very fact there. And they would have recognized that Jesus Christ here is claiming to be the God who established the Sabbath day in the first place. Wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? Jesus did establish the Sabbath in the, in the first place, didn't he? Absolutely he did. And if he established it and he's Lord over it, he's free to do whatever he sees fit on that day also, isn't he? <clears throat> Something to think about. Now, obviously Jesus never sinned. He never broke the fourth commandment, he never did. But he amplified the meaning of the Sabbath day by the many things that he actually did on the Sabbath day, didn't he? Many things that the Pharisees and scribes thought were illegal, were breaking God's law. Jesus did many things on the Sabbath day that in the eyes of the leadership there was wrong. It was wrong. <clears throat> no. Nope. He firmly established right in front of them and all those witnesses there that he himself was Lord even of the Sabbath day. And in verse 6, we see another breaking of the commandment on the Sabbath day, we'll see, or the Pharisees thought. Now it also came to pass on another Sabbath that he went into the synagogue and taught, and a man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees were watching him, whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, because that's such a bad thing to do. So that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts and said to the man who had a withered hand, Arise and stand in the midst so that all can see. Everybody. And he arose and he stood in their midst. And Jesus said to him, or Jesus said to them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful to do good or to do evil on the Sabbaths? To save life or to destroy it? And after looking around on all of them, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand, and he did so, and his hand was restored as sound as the other. <clears throat> and look how they responded. They were filled with rage. Rage. And consulted one another as to what they should do with Jesus. Good question here. What is okay to do on the Sabbath day? 
Is it lawful to do good or to do evil on the Sabbath day? It's a pretty good framed question, isn't it? And it's an open question, too. What is good? If you read the Bible, there's many references as to what are good and charitable deeds to do. And the way you behave among, among other people. So all that is good. So what is allowable on the Sabbath day, pretty much then? What's allowable on the Sabbath day? Everything good. Everything good. But good can be open for interpretation too, couldn't it? Yeah. But if you use the Bible as your guide, right? good acts, kindness, charity. Let's say you came upon someone who had a flat tire on the Sabbath day, you're coming, coming to church, and there was no one there around to help them. And they obviously were in distress that maybe they didn't have the right tools or the ability to change it themselves. Changing a tire is a lot of work sometimes, especially depending on the kind of vehicle. It can be. Not for that guy back there. <laughs> you know, city slickers. Yeah, city slickers. <laughs> but it's a lot more work than it is than plucking an ear of grain, isn't it? Now, would you pass that person by when they're in distress because it would require a lot of work? No. I like to refer to the stuff like that as the ox in the ditch. That is like the ox in the ditch situation. But there's many situations like that that can come your way on the Sabbath day. Now, what if someone asked you to help them shingle their roof on the Sabbath? There was nobody else that was available to help them. It was just them. And let's say they're halfway through the job. It was going to be raining the next day. They knew the weather forecast was there. And they needed to get that roof shingled. That's a different situation, isn't it? As someone who does actually <laughs> constantly get asked that yep. question, yep. the answer has always been no. Exactly. Always. That's why I use that example very specifically, because I knew you would know the answer to that. Yeah. That is not an emergency. Right? That would involve labor that is very laborious and uh, just not right. That, that's an obvious example. In, in, in my eye, and obviously yours too. Right? So there's, what's the, there's a gradient there too. Common sense as well. <clears throat> but people can judge you on, on what you yourself consider good on the Sabbath and what they themselves consider unacceptable on the Sabbath day. And following up on the last couple sermons and studies, what do we say about judging others? Who is the ultimate judge anyway? God. Jesus Christ. Very specifically, Jesus Christ. It's given him to judge. And in him only are you to answer to. And if you're convinced that the deed that you're doing for someone is a good act, an act that was necessary for you to do to help them in a time of trouble. I don't think Jesus would have a problem with that. But something to the extreme of, like, say, shingling a roof, you know, that's no. No, that's, that's something completely different there. But many, many times. You can be uh, confronted with a decision that you may have to make on the Sabbath day. What's acceptable and what's not. No. 
I come across that. I'm sure all of you do as well. The Pharisees had no leniency whatsoever. Very strict. Very, very strict. You know, even to the point that healing somebody was looked upon as being an evil thing. Healing somebody. I don't see where healing somebody could be evil. But they certainly did. Now, been in uh, God's church since 1991. So you encounter a lot of people in that time. And there's many opinions from many people on what is acceptable on the Sabbath and what isn't. There's many opinions. <coughs> Some different, some churches of God are much stricter than others. They even have little rules. And that falls into the category of legalism, which is not spiritualism. It's not, it's not the greater spiritual intent that Jesus Christ again and again showed by the things that he himself did on the Sabbath day. The priests do a lot of work on the Sabbath day. Especially when they had to sacrifice things. It's a lot of work. But they're not profaning the Sabbath when they do that. No. What I'm doing here is work. You know, it takes work to prepare it and work to do it. I'm not sacrificing animals, mind you. No. <clears throat> The Sabbath day can be a stumbling block. The Sabbath day can be a stumbling block. It can be a stumbling block also when someone throws that stumbling block in front of you, accusing you of doing something wrong on the Sabbath day. Again, Jesus Christ is the only ultimate judge of that. An important lesson to learn from this is don't throw a rock of stumbling in front of your brethren regarding something they may or may not be doing on the Sabbath day. You're not entirely sure. You've got to be very careful about that. Now, why were the scribes and Pharisees so enraged with Jesus? that he healed this man. Why were they filled with rage? That they couldn't do that? That they couldn't do that? No. no. I wouldn't imagine that would be, that would be the reason. No. Because they were legalists and that was construed as work. Yeah. They were legalists, that was construed as work. Yeah. But you're on the right vein, but more than that, He did something very public, didn't he? And he even threw a question at them. Put them on the spot. Put them on the spot. Called them out publicly. Called them out publicly. He called out their wrong teaching and their wrong hearts, their wrong attitudes. And they had no answer for him. They didn't answer that question, did they? Not recorded. I'm sure it would have been recorded if they had answered that question. Yeah, I don't think they want to. Ah, well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was a very public calling out because he called. He asked this man to stand in their midst, and he put them to the test. So he challenged their authority before the people and showed their error. What does it feel like to be challenged and to be shown your error, especially publicly? Has that ever happened to you? How do you feel? Embarrassed. Humiliated. <laughs> Humiliated? You just want to crawl into a hole. Humiliated is a good response. <laughs> Angered? 
That's the wrong response. Do you fight back to hold your stand? I'm right and that's the end of it? Or do you look within and see whether or not, well, maybe you're not right? That's what you have to do. Do you have the right attitude? Do you have the right humility to be able to see the error? They obviously didn't. <coughs> they were enraged, filled with rage. When you're filled with rage, you're capable of murder. That's what they were like. I don't recall ever being filled with rage. Anger, yes, but filled with rage. I don't, I don't recall ever reaching a point like that. Yes. That's not maintaining proper discipline and control over your emotions. Instead of being grateful that they could learn something new so that they could better serve God and the people that they were in, in, you know, entrusted to serve, they should have been grateful to learn how better to serve God and, and the people. But instead they were enraged. So that tells you a lot about the condition of the heart. <clears throat> and likewise, when we respond, how is, how is our heart when we're confronted with things? It's hard sometimes. Do we cling to old traditions too? in the face of God's revelation. This is the way it's always been. This is the way I've always known it to be. When maybe it's not quite correct. Are you willing to change that? Well, a lot can be learned from that. Unfortunately, these Pharisees and scribes didn't learn any of that. we can learn from it and that is why it's recorded like that <laughs> now remember we, we talked last time about how much jesus spent in prayer with his father in verse 12 it says it came to pass in those days that he went up into the mountain to pray and he spent the entire night in prayer to god have you ever prayed for an entire night it's a long time Kind of run out of things to say, wouldn't you? You would think. I don't think I've had a conversation with anybody for that length of time. <laughs> but it's interesting, Jesus Christ did. And he did that often. He was very close to God every day. He was in the light constantly. Let's go to verse 18. And those who were tormented by unclean spirits also came, and they were healed. Now, we read many times throughout the Gospels about unclean spirits being in people and being cast out. Jesus cast them out, the disciples cast them out. Where are these unclean spirits now? Are they still possessing people today? I would say. Have we ever seen it ourselves? Yes. Probably, yeah. Probably may not recognize it for what it is sometimes, but probably. <clears throat> now, what is it like to be a Christian? Awesome. Awesome. Hard. Hard. 
Yes. Awesome and hard. And rewarding. And joyful. And sometimes you can feel discouraged from how you're received by the world, too, right? And how should we interact with those around us that are not Christians? You're supposed to let others see. You're supposed to shine regardless of whether they believe or not. We're supposed to lead by example. Exactly. And from verse 20 to 38, it's kind of like a guide of many different instances and things that we encounter. He lifted up his eyes upon his disciples, not upon the larger crowd, but upon his disciples. And he said, Blessed are you, the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now. Hungering for what? <clears throat> Not hungering for food. It's hungering for God's kingdom. You will be there. Blessed are those who weep now at the state of this world, pretty much. At all the unrighteousness that's going on. For you shall laugh when all unrighteousness is gone. Blessed are you when men shall hate you because you follow God and cut you off and reproach you and cast out your name as wicked because you believe in Jesus Christ. To be a Christian today is harder than 50, 60, 70 years ago, I would say. There's a lot more attack on us today. Don't be discouraged. Jesus says, blessed are you when you encounter these troubles in the world. And people will say all manner of things, ridicule you and what you believe, or worse. <clears throat> Instead, rejoice and leap for joy, because a great reward is waiting for you. It's not a strange thing. They persecuted the fathers and the, th and the prophets just the same. But woe to them who are rich, so to speak, who have everything that they ever wanted, ever, ever dreamed in a carnal way, because they're receiving their gift now, physical things. You have a very good and comfortable life. You could have a very good and comfortable life. But what will it profit you? Because you only have how many days on this planet? And all your wealth will be gone. And you've got no treasure beyond that. Woe to you who, are, who have been filled and, and don't hunger at all because Every carnal thing that you desire is satisfied. You shall mourn and weep instead of laughing. <clears throat> because you really don't have anything. This, this life is too short. It's far too short. And it's a precious thing to receive the good things of God rather than the good things of this world. Sure, the good things of this world are fun to have. 
and it's nice to be comfortable. It's nice to be able to have a shower every day if you want. It's nice to be able to eat whatever you find in your refrigerator is full and you can drink clean water and sleep under a roof that doesn't leak and don't have to be worried about someone killing you tomorrow in a bomb or something like that. We are truly blessed in this world physically also. God takes care of our needs. Woe to you when all men shall speak well of you. <clears throat> because you're one of them. Their fathers did these same things to the false prophets. I say to you here, I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Who does that? Who loves their enemies? And who does good to those who hate you? Didn't they hate Jesus Christ? They were filled with rage. <laughs> the ones who truly hated him. God still gave them food to eat, clothes to wear, comfortable place to sleep. Still allowed them to have good things. God could have struck them down. But instead he did good things to them. Gave them life. Bless those who curse you. <coughs> and pray for those who despitefully <coughs> use you. See, that's, that's hard to do. <coughs> what would most people do if they were cursed at and were despitefully used? What do most people do? Get back at them. Absolutely. Being a Christian means you're elevated way beyond that. You're to expect that kind of treatment from the world. And you're to brush that off and you're to do good. It's like, is it good to do good on the Sabbath day? Or is it good to do evil on the Sabbath day? Or indeed every day? <clears throat> you come to something like if someone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other cheek also. That's, that's pretty bold. Does he really mean to turn your head and say, okay, hit me again? I wouldn't imagine he means exactly that. <clears throat> but you don't strike back at them. Unless, of course, they intend to kill you, then you have a perfect right to try to defend yourself, or a family member, for instance. It is not you, as a Christian, to seek vengeance or revenge against someone who does something like like these things that are being described let god take care of that and let the authorities today take care of that if somebody was to mug you you don't go and take and seek revenge on said person the authorities do that find them guilty and send them to jail. Back before there was authority, governments, right? Let's say someone killed a family member, murdered them. 
it was perfectly in their rights for a family member to go after that person. And there were cities of refuge that people could go to to be saved from vengeance. But there weren't authorities in place at that time to take care of that evil thing that occurred. In this time when Jesus was speaking, there was. Do not seek justice on your own. Let the world's systems do that and let God, in the end, do that. <clears throat> if someone takes your cloak, let them take it. Instead, this is how you should be. Give everyone to everyone who asks you, if you're able to. If you're able to, yeah. And if anyone takes what is yours, don't ask for it back. In other words, if you lend somebody something, for instance, it's okay to hope for it back, but you may not get it back. You may not get it back, whatever it is. Don't go confronting said person and demand it back. Remind them maybe, oh hey, remember I lent you such and such? You still got that? Yeah. But don't confront and demand said item back. Exactly as you would have men treat you, you do the same. How would you want to be treated? Even treat your enemies like that. Do good to them. <clears throat> do good to them. You don't have to hang out with them. <laughs> Associate with them. But if there's a need, and they're in need, and you know about it, and you can help them, help them. Maybe they've run out of food, need some groceries. It's an easy thing to do. You might even turn an enemy to, into a friend. How do we come to repentance anyway? By being made aware of our wrongdoing and becoming humbled. Doing good to someone who is not in a repentant state could help bring them into a repentant state. You don't know. If you love only those who love you, that's easy. That's easy. It's harder to love those who can't stand you. <clears throat> if you're only doing good to those who are doing good to you, God gives good things to all, even the wicked. Love your enemies, do good, lend, hoping for nothing again. That's the right attitude. And that will lead to a greater reward for you in the end. Because God is good to the unthankful and the wicked. And so should you be. Sometimes that's hard. Sometimes that's hard. 
But it should be second nature for us. Be compassionate, even as your father is compassionate. And above all, don't judge others, so that you yourself are not judged in any way. Don't condemn others. So he won't be condemned either. Then look in your own mirror. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give freely and generously, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over. Shall they give into your bosom? For with the same measure that you mete out, it shall be measured again to you. Give generously, live generously, live compassionately. Live with forgiveness in your heart. And these things will be shown upon you by God. <clears throat> when Jesus says in 39, is a blind man able to lead a blind man? Will not both fall into the ditch? What does he mean by that? you're not aware of any issues you have or if you're holding on to things you you know that you're not making sure you're right and you're living the right way how can you show others how to live that way yeah if you're not living the right way too how can you show others to live the right way yes see it's it's hard Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Make sure that you are doing good. And then you can help others. It reminds me of when you fly a plane and the stewardess gives you the instructions in the case of an emergency. You just secure your own mask before you can help somebody else. Because then you're in a better state to be able to help somebody else. Absolutely. And it's that same spiritual readiness as well. If your heart is right, your heart and mind are in the right place to be able to help somebody else. Yeah, when your heart and mind are in the right place, then you can help someone else. Take care of yourself first, spiritually, and then you can help others spiritually. Because you are not above Jesus Christ. The disciple is not above his teacher. You are not above Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Jesus Christ was righteous in all ways. And he can and will judge us. Righteously. So if you know this, happy are you. And everyone who is perfected, everyone who becomes like Jesus Christ, will become like him, which is the teacher. But until you become that way, we're going to be perfected one day, and then we will be like the teacher. Right now we're just the disciples. Right now we're just the disciples, working towards being a teacher. To get that PhD so you can stand before others and teach them. So if you can't open your own eye, because of your own, own blindness, you can't help someone else. And why do you look at the sliver? Notice it says a sliver. 
a tiny thing that's in your brother's eye. Why are you looking at that and you don't recognize the beam? It's a huge thing in your own eye. Why are you paying attention to a sliver that's in your brother's eye when you have a beam in your own? And how can you say to your brother, let me help you get that sliver out of your eye. Let me help you with your sin. When you can't see the mountain of sin in your own life, it's hard. And first cast out that beam from your own eye, and then you can see clearly to help get the sliver out of your brother's eye. Then you can help your brother get that sliver out. That's a hard one for Christians, too. This thing about judging each other. Why do churches break up? Why do people leave a church group? Is it because of the doctrine? Or is it because of the relationships of the people in the group? Why do people break up? It's a good question. We all know the answer. It's not because of doctrine. Generally. Sometimes a, a, church, a greater church on a whole does change the doctrine. And the ministers preach false doctrine. And usually churches that do that, there's a great fall in the way. There's many that leave. I'm not referring to that. I'm referring to why, why do some individuals just leave church, a church? Right? If there truly is a problem with doctrine and, and the teaching or pharisaical approach of a church, absolutely leave that church. Find one that is teaching right. But if it's got nothing to do with that, if it's personal relationships, you have to work it out with your, your brothers and sisters. You have to work it out. Because if you both get to the kingdom, that's eternity. What, are you never going to see, talk to each other in the kingdom? That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. <clears throat> Let's go to verse 46. I want to just look at that. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you do not practice what I say? What's the key word there? Practice. Practice. No. Practicing means you're not perfect at it. Practicing means you can make mistakes as well. But you're trying. You're trying. You're trying to practice what Jesus said, which means doing. Which means doing. All the things we talked about earlier in Luke 6, of how we need to interact with the people in the world and with our fellow brothers and sisters. If you are practicing what Jesus has showed us, then we won't fail because it, we will be like a man who built a house and dug deep and laid the foundation on rock. And all manner of trouble came and beat at the house, but it stood. All the trials and tribulations that we encounter, all the things that the world can cast at us, can't move us. If you're not practicing, 
to follow what Jesus showed us. Then you're not very skilled at handling the trials that come. And the trials that come will break you. The trials that come will break you. How do you become a professional at anything? You do it for a living. Which means you have to, you do it for a living. You, you have to do it on a regular basis, yes. How do you become a professional Christian? Do it for a living. You do it for a living. Mm -hmm. Look at it that way. Are we professional Christians? Or are we still in school? Both. It is both. Mm -hmm. It is both. Yes. As a Christian, you can still be in school as a disciple to the teacher, but you can also be practicing it as a professional. Consider it continuing education. It is continuing education. <laughs> yeah. I have continuing ed education in my career all the time, always learning. And they call what I do practicing. I practice what I do. Yeah. And I'm considered a professional. But what I do is called a practice. <laughs> yes. Because I do it all the time. And I've been doing it for 22 years. Yep, 22 years now. So I'm pretty good at it. You're still practicing. But I'm still practicing. <laughs> one day you'll get better. Because one day I'll get better. <laughs> <laughs> One day I'll get even better than I am today. Yes. Yeah. It takes time to develop skill. It takes time to develop skill. It takes time to become a skillful Christian. To be able to have meat instead of the milk. You can't be on milk forever. You can't be on milk forever. You have to move on to the meat. And you can only do that by practicing every day and growing every day against the world, which is an upstream battle like those salmon spawning, going up the waterfall. I just don't know how they do that. This is you ever seen that? Yeah. It's incredible what they can do. In Penticton, we saw that. Do you remember that? The, the dam? Yes, I we remember the seeing the fish in the dam. Yeah, it was Jumping close. back upstream. It was amazing how they, how they could do that. But they're focused. They're driven to accomplish it. They'll either get to that stream to spawn or they will die trying. <laughs> That's what it's like to be a Christian, going against the hard stream, even against the waterfall, or die trying. And if you die trying, you're safe and secure because you were practicing. You will be there. And being in the kingdom is like being at the Feast of Tabernacles, which is next week. <laughs> wow. Mm -hmm. Next week. By this time next week, we should be there. Hey. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see you shortly at the Feast of Tabernacles, won't we? Yeah.